Welcome to Stratford's Guildhall and the surrounding buildings. I'm just now on this beautiful spring day with the sun in my eyes, sitting outside the pedagogue's house, built in the beginning of the 16th century and used today as the headmaster's study. Behind me, you can see in the semi-distance the tower of the Guild Chapel, another of the Guild's buildings in this part of Stratford. And then the Guild Hall itself, a wonderful building constructed in the first years of the 15th century, about 1418 to 1420, and really taking within itself the whole history of Stratford over that period from then till now. Michael Wood, the historian and broadcaster, called it a memory room of our culture, a memory room for Stratford, but a memory room too for the whole of our country and perhaps for the whole of the world, because here was Shakespeare's classroom where he was educated and a great deal more in the history of Stratford. Here we are in the Lower Guildhall. I want to start and concentrate on these extremely rare wall paintings, which have remained visible, though only just, from the 15th century to the present day. They're based on the seal of the Guild of the Holy Cross. Here in the center is the cross itself with Christ crucified. One touching detail is that we can see the hand of God here on the upright timber. On either side, he has the Virgin Mary, and on the further side, St. John Baptist. And flanking these are the royal arms here. To the right, you will see the arms of the Beecham Dispenser family, the family of the great nobleman of the area, the Earl of Warwick. So that you have a coming together of both ecclesiastical and political power uh, at the time. But what interests me almost more than these wonderful paintings are the decorative schemes that are visible, just visible, on these uprights. You can see the red background, but if you look very carefully, you can see here what looks like a modern IHS, but in fact are the Greek letters IES, the first letters of the name of Jesus. Here are the Tudor roses, white and red, dating the paintings from the latter end of the 15th century. And here you will see the crowned M, which is a symbol for the Virgin Mary. I think it's these that clinch the case for this being a private chapel for the priests of the Guild of the Holy Cross from the earliest days of the Guildhall. An altar was positioned here, right in front of these paintings and below their level. The painting served as a reredos for the altar, re-establishing the ownership of the Guild of the Holy Cross for this chapel. We're here in Church Street, one of the main traffic axes of modern Stratford, and also part of what we are now calling the historic spine that links the birthplace, Shakespeare's birthplace, to the place where he was educated here in the Guildhall, and onto the church where he is buried. 
These historic buildings are, all of them, associated with the Guild of the Holy Cross in the heart of the town for which they were responsible for such a long period. One point of interest, which we've only discovered recently by documentary and archaeological research, is that this house, immediately next to the Guildhall, was the location for the school before it moved into the upper floor of the Guildhall. At the first of those buildings, what, what we have always called the infill house, mm. we now know is actually an earlier building. It is the building of 1427, the earliest school building. We know that the timbers that were built in the infill house were felled in 1425 or around that date. And so that ties us in very nicely with our first documentary reference to the school in 1427. Mm. And thanks to the work of Bob Behrman, we've been able to use the 16th century records of that building being leased out in the later part of the 16th century, when the school has probably, of course, moved into this building, mm. where it's described as the former schoolhouse with a chamber over it. And that's very interesting, the size of that building. It's very small, single room, but mm. it nevertheless is one of the earliest dated timber schoolhouses in the country. So mm. it might look very small, but actually it's really important in its own right. And it, it helps set the stage, as it were, for the school coming into this building when Indeed. it grows. Indeed. And we think, do we not, that the ground floor of that immediately adjacent arms house was the schoolhouse and the master lived on the upper floor yes. above. Yes. I mean, one of the interesting things is when you say that that uh, 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 arms house is small, so it is. Uh, but it would fit in terms of size with what we believe to have been uh, the schoolroom uh, up above here yes. uh, in the guild hall. 40, maybe 60 boys crammed into that small space. We remain amazed uh, that all that range of ages could be taught together and that number of, uh, of, of boys. Yes, we're so used to thinking of schools today as these enormous buildings that actually the idea of one room in which children sat very respectfully on benches and listened to the master. There wasn't much room for messing about in those early grammar schools, probably. Um, uh, as they grew, of course, that provides more capacity for the school to grow in reputation. But the earliest schoolhouse is, is quite small, and we're now quite convinced that it's the building next door. I never dare to take issue with you, uh, Kate, on, on, these, on these matters of archaeology and, and the, uh, the uh, conclusions that come from it. But I'm not sure that the schoolroom was as well behaved <laughs> as, you, as you suggest. Uh, one of the engravings that I've dug up shows boys behaving uh, a little irregularly uh, in the schoolroom, and it is dated to the 1570s, so very much Shakespeare's time at school. Got a dog in the middle of the classroom. So altogether, although, and the headmaster likes to believe this, the school was well disciplined yes. from the beginning it may or may not have yes. been um, boys will be boys i suppose ronnie <laughs> yes. and every schoolhouse probably had a very lively culture yes this is the upper guild hall which is perhaps the most famous part of the whole building this is a wonderful perspective right down the full length of the upper guild hall Surely one of the finest perspectives of architectural merit anywhere in not only Stratford, but in Great Britain. Yet in William Shakespeare's day, there was a dividing wall, a partition at this point, a partition which had originally enclosed a buttery and a pantry. I'm standing right beside an 18th century master's chair, very similar to the master's chairs of Shakespeare's day. What was a Tudor classroom actually like? What was it like to be actually present? What was the atmosphere? What was the master like? Where did he sit? What number of boys would you expect to find in that classroom? What ages? We have very few drawings of Tudor classrooms actually available to us, but we do have three. And I'm going to discuss those with Solomon Hayes, a senior pupil 
at King Edward VI School. Well, it's nothing like a classroom today. We have boys on benches or with books open on laps. There's no, uh, no desks. There's lots of boys of uh, very different ages, from very small to 15, 16. And we've got a boy reciting to, to a master, and the master appears to be giving him some sort of... Oh, I'm not entirely sure what it is exactly, but we can see there's a, a broom and a plate of apples underneath. Yes, you're quite right, exactly. The boys are in varied ages, and you can see that even in this engraving, and we'll see more in a moment, there are quite a lot of boys there, and we think there were something like 40 and even up to 60 boys present in this classroom when William Shakespeare sat in it. Yes, you're right, the boy is reciting his lesson, which was a wonderful memory training for boys who were going to go on in as their profession to become a lawyer, or an administrator, and of course, if they were going into the theatre, as we now know William Shakespeare was. And yes, here under the master's desk are two symbols. One, a broom, you say, or a birch, uh, which was used to chastise wayward boys, and the other, a plate of apples. And one of the really touching things about this engraving is that the master is offering the boy an apple for doing a good job with reciting his lesson. And you know, I often, when I look at this, think how, how tender it is to have in on this first form, the bottom here, two little boys clearly comforting each other when they're for the first time in this strange and unfamiliar place. Just think for a moment or two, Solomon, what it was like to be a master in this room. We know that there was only one master teaching all the boys, 40 to 60, at any one time, in the early years particularly, of this classroom and of William Shakespeare's years at the school. So, 40 boys, all ages, at different stages of the curriculum, one master, no help, unless he brought in a senior boy. Uh, to help him, it must have been hell. Can't have been any better than that. Now, you mentioned benches that the boys are sitting on. It is rather remarkable because people think they were sitting on desks. In fact, they were on benches, and benches were known as forms. And forms may well give us first form, second form, third form, up to sixth form today. This is the second engraving, with similarities to the one we've just looked at, but differences too. What do you think of this one? Oh, it's, it's a right odd mob, isn't it? There's lots of boys everywhere. But there are similarities, like you said, you've got the boy reciting to, to, to a master there, wearing similar headgear, similar, similar gown. But there are key differences in, well, what's that over there? It looks like some sort of chart, or I suspect it's, it's more like music. And of course, in this corner here, we have what appears to be a boy being beaten. Yes, we're absolutely right about all those points. The headgear is the same, and why has he got this funny square hat on his head? Well, it's because he was a graduate, and in Stratford that was normally an Oxford graduate. So far as the chart on the wall is concerned, yes, music was part of the curriculum, and indeed there were song schools. There was a song school in Stratford, and the boys of the choir at Holy Trinity were taught to sing as well, as you might expect. And in the corner, as you said, here is an unfortunate boy being whipped or being birched for not really remembering or reciting his lesson correctly. Uh, fortunately, there is good evidence that this wasn't a frequent occurrence, though I know that many books suggest that it was. But it happened. There it is. And even this master hearing the lessons has got his birch rod, just as a warning. You've got to know this stuff or you're getting into trouble. This is the third of the engravings. And it's attached to a book by Alexander Noel, a catechism. 
Unfortunately, it has similarities to what we've already seen, but differences too. And it could be that this is much more like what Shakespeare's classroom was than the rather idealizing first engraving we looked at. What do you think of it? It's a bit chaotic. I mean, for starters, we have boys who appear to be fighting there. And what on earth is that dog doing in the middle? I'll, I'll, I'll never know, really. But uh, there are similarities. There's a boy reciting, so headmaster, but he appears to be wearing, well, what appears to be a sun hat there, and certainly not the <laughs> usual yeah. headwear. There are boys studying, but what are those boys sharing there? I, I'd be quite interested to know. And also, is, what's this boy doing here? Is he, is he coming in, going out? Was it really like this? Well, who knows? Uh, maybe not exactly like that, but I don't think this is too far from the classroom in which William Shakespeare sat and where he clearly was a boy with a very retentive memory because many of the things he studied in the classroom turn up again in his plays. And yes, these boys are unquestionably fighting. This one's tweaking the other one's ear and one fears what the response might have been. And uh, yes, the headmaster is differently dressed. I don't think he's got quite the same kind of garments on. Uh, and his hat is certainly different, probably because he wasn't a graduate, not just that he wanted to be fashionable. But yes, you're right. Here are boys sharing something here. I like to think it was their breakfast that they would brought in because it was a break for breakfast in, in the morning. And... Uh, Despite these distractions, here's a boy, we'll call him William Shakespeare, who is actually still reading his book and studying. But it's possible he's doing that because he didn't do his studying the previous evening and he's got to get it ready before he steps up to present it to the master. This boy is, of course, presenting his work to the master. But yes, the real flavour of the whole thing is this boy. As you say, is he coming in or going out? We don't know. I rather like to think he's bunking off when the master's attention was focused on this boy here and the dog in the middle of everything, gnawing his bone. Did they have livestock in Shakespeare's classroom? Well, we don't know, but I don't think it's entirely unlikely. Well, Solomon, thanks very much indeed for participating in this. It is a bit different from King Herbert VI's uh, school, but maybe your distance from it has given you a sense of uh, the advantages and the privileges of being here at this school now. And yet and yet, there's a continuous education for the last, oh, 450 years in this very room. So maybe one feels that too. It's been a pleasure. One last question. We have seen the images of what the boys were doing, but what are they actually studying? A very good question. Come over here to the master's chair and I'll give you an answer. <clears throat> You're the boy reciting your lesson, as it were. But what were you reciting? Well, as everybody knows, the main core of education at the time was Latin. And as I've said, it was useful to boys in their future careers. But what Latin exactly? Well, I'm afraid day to day it was Lily's Latin grammar, which remained a form of study right up to almost my own day. Well, that's not yesterday, but it's not a hundred years ago either. And what is it? Well, it's all about conjugating verbs and the analysis of grammatical structure and so on and so on. You'd think it was monumentally boring, and it probably was. But they went on to study other things, particularly in the middle and upper forms. They would study classical literature. And the imagination of a boy like Shakespeare was certainly fired by reading, say, Ovid particularly, uh, but also, no doubt, Cicero for rhetoric and speeches and history because the Latin historians gave a guide to how the modern historians of English history wrote. So all those things were going on in Shakespeare's mind and forming his mind. But what we specially remember in this place, and when we're talking about William Shakespeare, is that they studied plays. 
Now, of course, they studied plays in order to learn more Latin and to become more proficient in it. But they didn't just learn it in a rote learning kind of way. They also had the opportunity to act it out. And I'm convinced that playing the plays of Terence, like Eunicus or Formio or the Adelphi, one of those plays, William Shakespeare said, gosh, I think that's for me. And he went on to write a few successful plays in his day. I've come now to the other side of the partition that divided the upper guild hall. Shakespeare's classroom, we've left, and we've now come into the space that was used as a feast hall and for other purposes, such as hosting the visiting acting companies after the Reformation. The, this space uh, doesn't seem, perhaps to some people, very ample as a theatre space, but in fact, it has proved so when we've made trial of it. The space is not very large, but at least we can see where the bailiff will have sat for the licensing performance, which we're about to describe. I'm very fortunate to have with me today Dr. Margaret Shuring, who is Reader in Theatre Studies at the University of Warwick. Welcome, Margaret. You and I have both studied uh, the visits to the Guildhall by acting companies of Shakespeare's time, more than 30 visits, uh, in fact. The companies who came to Stratford certainly included the leading companies of the time. For example, the Earl of Leicester's men, who were in the early 1570s the dominant company by royal invitation at the annual performance seasons at court. The Earl, as you know, was Queen Elizabeth's favourite and owned Kenilworth Castle. His players came here in 1572 to 3 and 1576 to 7, when Shakespeare was at school in this building, as well as in 1587, just before the company folded. One of the period's most famous clowns, Richard Tarleton, was with the Queen's men and may well have visited Stratford in that show. Yes, yeah, so there's a rather intriguing little note uh, which comes in that list of visitors. Uh, which says that the Queen's men, during one of their visits, broke one of the forms or benches, yes. which presumably they'd borrowed from the classroom. Yeah. Was Tarleton the perpetrator of this outrage, do you think? It'd be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would, and makes sense too. Absolutely. Given what we know of Tarleton and his escapades. And particularly since he ad-libbed so much. Indeed, uh, that was his reputation, wasn't it? Absolutely. Now, just one further thing is puzzling me. Uh, all the companies you mentioned seem to have the names of noble or royal patrons. Why was that? Well, by Shakespeare's day, that was the law. A company couldn't tour unless they had the patronage of a nobleman or a member of the royal household. In a way, I suppose it was another form of overseeing or controlling even censoring what the actors were playing. Yes. Well, well let's just come back to here. Uh, do you think this uh, space was actually a viable space for the performance of plays of that period? Oh, yes, I think we can say that with some confidence. We've had a clear demonstration of this in a thoroughly convincing performance of King John, also a Queen's Men's play, staged here by York University students with some KES schoolboys as extras. That production, you remember, was directed by Ollie Jones, who has written about the whole experience of working in this space. We've begun to see a possible continuity between Shakespeare's education and his future career. And there are other really rather remarkable continuities in this very schoolroom. Because here I'm standing among the desks of the Georgian schoolroom, 150 years after Shakespeare was a pupil at this school. These desks are original to the early 18th century, and you will easily see how deeply they have been incised 
Richard, you're archivist uh, at the school and you've built up a really, really exciting uh, archive. When I was speaking to the headmaster, uh, he mentioned the importance of Robert de Courcy Laffan as a recent uh, headmaster of the school who made a, a considerable contribution. Can you say something about the nature of uh, Lafan's contribution to the school? Uh, Lafan was very fortunate in that, A, he was a great traditionalist, but also because he came at a time when he was great friends with the, the uh, vicar of the Holy Trinity, mm. but also with Archibald Flower, the Flower yes. family. Yes. And because he was head of the school, he did write one time saying he sat one day in big school and said he could sense the spirits of the past oh, right. yes. and he needed to restore the school. And because he was a great traditionist and a great historian, mm. with these two other people to encourage him, he realised it was time to try and restore the buildings to their form glory. Yes. I gather that one of his innovations, uh, or it may have been his wife's innovation, was to set up the Shakespeare procession that takes boys from the school down to the church on the Shakespeare anniversary each year. Uh, can you fill us in on that a little bit? He was also a great enthusiast for Shakespeare, was surprised that there was no commemoration and hadn't mm. been for many, many years. And so they were one or two boys walked to the church on the anniversary. Mm. And that began an established tradition mm. that then has existed since that time. Uh, roughly what date was uh, that first? 1893. 1893. 1893. Now that's been questioned, but we have verification because of its significance. It was both in local Birmingham and the Times mm. noted that mm. the fan had done that. Here we are, back where we started. I'm sitting again, uh, just in front of the pedagogue's house, with, in the distance, the tower of the Guild Chapel, and in between, the Guild Hall. In fact, we may think that in 2020, we will be able to celebrate the 600th anniversary of the final construction of the Guild Hall in this place. What could be more wonderful? dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. 